I'm Pastor Richard Stadler, and I'm here again with Ann Carter and with Father Chuck Carter, and we're talking Sunday readings. And we're talking about the readings for Lent 3, the third Sunday in Lent. And the Old Testament lesson is from Exodus chapter 17, 1 to 7. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And then the gospel is in Luke chapter 11, verses 14 to 28. So let's take a look at the Old Testament lesson in Exodus 17. A reading from Exodus. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so, in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The children of Israel have been miraculously released from slavery in Egypt. They've miraculously been saved by God who kept them from being overwhelmed by the Egyptian army who chased after them when he parted the Red Sea for them. And they are on their way now down to Mount Sinai where they will meet with God and he will form them into a nation. And they start to grumble. Mm, mm. <laughs> they grumble and they quarrel with Moses, and Moses understands this as an attack on God. Mm-hmm. And he says, you are not just quarreling with me when you tell me you don't have any water and you blame me for not having any water. You're really putting God to the test. Mm-hmm. And uh, why can't you be more thankful? Look at all the things he's already done for you. Mm-hmm. He's not going to forget you. He will take care of you. Mm-hmm. And uh, God assures Mo- uh, Moses I will stand before you. So take your rod, hit the rock on Mount Horeb. So apparently Rephidim is close enough to Mount Horeb that they can go to the Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, we think, mm-hmm. the range that uh, includes Mount Sinai. And uh, sure enough, he hits the mm-hmm. rock and out comes the water. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, they named the place in honor of those two things, the quarreling, Massah and the te- and the, the the testing of God is Massah, uh, and the quarreling is built on a Hebrew word for to quarrel uh, Meribah, yeah. and uh, later again there'll be another place where they run out of water and they complain, and uh, God will give them water there too. That's in Numbers 21, and uh, that place is also called Meribah, mm-hmm. and it kind of links the two places together. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting that. God gives the people a miracle, but the miracle isn't celebrated. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's it's commemorated at least in Psalm ninety five, yeah. where uh, <laughs> do not do not put me to the test as your forebears did in the wilderness at at Meribah, <laughs> at Masa. Um, uh, it's not celebrated. It's mm-hmm. not a celebrated fact. It's right. it's a uh, it's a uh, um, if you will. Uh, uh, kind of a mark of shame in some ways mm-hmm. that um, that they would put God to the test in this way, and uh, um, even though God fulfilled His end, if mm-hmm. you will, uh, came to the came to the rescue and showed them what to do, it's still not um, uh, seen as a, a a thing to rejoice over, mm-hmm. it's, it, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, so I just make that point. Um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna. D- just be on the side of the Israelites playing devil's advocate. I, if, I have seen the desert. 
-hmm. And I, if I didn't have any water, I would be scared, mm -hmm. just frightened. Mm -hmm. And the only person that I would know who to blame for any of it or for who to ask is Moses. And it's interesting then that they haven't, from my understanding, they have not seen God. They have not seen the Shekinah yet because the temperate tabernacle isn't. So they, and they've tried to, they, they will try to build a representation of him. But so far, he's kind of this unseen kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? So then he gives them the second gift. He gives them water, but he also shows them that he's, mm -hmm. he's real. He isn't a figment of Moses' imagination. Mm -hmm. I will be standing there. Mm -hmm. I think that's, well, I just think that's but a great gift. if he's non-corporeal, they aren't going to be able to see him anyway. He's a spirit. It, it, the fact that he says, I'm standing there, doesn't mean that he's going to corporally make himself visible. Sure. But you're right, that this is, more. I think, more of assurance to, to Moses, who's afraid they're going to stone him, that he says, I'll be there as your guard. You don't and think that a, he is showing himself to the Oh, people. no, I don't think that, I, I don't think there's anything in the text that suggests okay. that he's manifesting himself visibly. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but he is assuring Moses, uh, you're not going up there alone to take on this this whole mm -hmm. mob, you mm -hmm. know, and so forth. What I find interesting is that there is a Jewish tradition that a rock, this rock, followed after the children of Israel throughout their whole four years of wandering. Mm -hmm. And it was there in Numbers. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Paul pull, pulls on that in 1 Corinthians 10 when he says okay. they had a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so okay. is Paul playing on that legend? You know, the, the only documentation we can find of the legend is in a, a document called Pseudo Philo. And, okay. uh, and, and so uh, there's nothing in the scriptures that say that. Sure. Um, and that the, the about rock, this rock? Yeah, okay. about the rock following them okay. and continuing to give them water okay. day after day after day after day. Uh, but apparently it must have stopped. And so uh, they have to have it again. And yeah. so, and, and in Pseudophilo, it's not called a rock, it's called a well. A well followed them, and they, they drew from that. Okay. Uh, but, you know, uh, what was Paul referring to there? Mm -hmm. was he, he must have been thinking that the Jews had some recognition of mm -hmm. some water source that was accompanying them, and that he's using that now as an allegory or a metaphor for the spiritual presence of Christ was with them, too, because he's already alive at the time of the Exodus. Yeah. So... But, Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that takes us to the epistle lesson. Mm -hmm. A reading from Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Romans 5, uh, continuing in uh, what can be a rather dense argument by Paul. Um, the one thing that I... That I was that struck me this time was the word boast and I've heard it of course before we boast in our hope we boast in our um, sufferings we boast in God so I decided what does the word boast exactly mean and it means to talk to talk with excessive pride or self-satisfaction and he's saying don't talk with excessive pride boast in God but still we're supposed to talk and mm -hmm. I don't know that we I don't 
I know that we're supposed to share, um, but I don't know that it is a, a habit of, certainly not of mine, to go out and say, yeah, I've had all of these sufferings and, and God gave them to me. And, and, and um, it's, and he's seeing me through them. I think that we like to hide behind certain things. But he says that we're supposed to, that we're supposed to talk about it. Well, when I preached on this text many years ago, I was visiting uh, uh, 20 to 30 people a month um, in their homes and residences. And so I asked each one that I visited, I said, uh, I read this text to them about mm -hmm. how we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but that um, we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. I said, have you seen that in your Christian life? These are all veteran Christians who have mm -hmm. been Christians for a long time. And to a person, they all said it. And then this one older lady, about 90 years old, quoted uh, John chapter 3 mm. about the love of Christ mm. verbatim mm. for about three verses and said, that's what we have to focus on is the love of God, mm. even when things aren't going well for us. And I thought, uh, I wish I had quoted her, I mean, uh, taped her, so mm -hmm. I could have played that in a sermon because that mm -hmm. would have been powerful mm -hmm. for the people in the pew to hear a fellow Christian saying, okay, I haven't had it easy, but I know that God is using this to grow me mm -hmm. and to pull yeah. me closer to him. It's mm -hmm. just a, a wonderful affirmation. Mm -hmm. yeah. We live in a world where we create this narrative of our lives that everything's wonderful and everything's perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think that does an injustice to, to our own creation of character. If we don't admit that there are challenges and that we're getting through yeah. them. Or we also have uh, the, the other side of that, which is kind of a, a glorification of certain forms of, of oppression and suffering, yes. which mm -hmm. is also, I think, kind of a, a, a gross over, um, overuse of this. Well, it's very self-serving. Self-serving, so. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and yeah. I think different religious traditions are better at that, of mm -hmm. sharing their suffering and their... Um, frailties and their uh, problems. Uh, when I've gone to some charismatic churches, mm -hmm. they seem to be much more open about that. And, and I have to admit that a lot of the Lutheran churches I go to, you say, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. You know, mm -hmm. and that's the end of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so maybe the, uh, there are different cultures that are better at sharing that without becoming burdensome. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's the problem okay. when, when most of us suffer. A lot of us suffer, I should say. Um, we don't want to burden other people with our sure. problems, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yep. you know, instead of using our stories to praise well, God. God. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'll can I get back. My translation says boast, but you said rejoice. Yeah, mine so doesn't is that... have boast. I, I okay. Think, mm. um, rejoice is probably a, a better translation there. So mm -hmm. I'm surprised at that. Which translation? This is, that? is the um, new revised. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Um, so it's interesting, um, depending upon how they, it was chosen to translate, you can come to different. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Recontextualizing or, or putting Paul into his own context, I know that the culture in which Paul wrote was a culture heavily dominated by uh, honor and shame. And so, for instance, when uh, Paul writes that, I think it's Paul, that Christ endured uh, the cross and its shame, not so much the pain, but the shame. And that's, that's, that's elsewhere. I don't think that shows up in our readings today. But uh, this idea of, of suffering and being tied with shame rather than with pain, uh, we wouldn't rejoice in, so in something that would bring shame upon us. Mm -hmm. But this is part of the radical nature of, of, of salvation, is that these things which we might uh, shun or, or, or uh, go away from, um, try and reject, uh, these become occasions for rejoicing now mm -hmm. because of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to revise that a little bit, my answer to you, Anne. Okay. That the, the word that's used in the Greek text um, can be translated uh, to, uh, I guess you could use the word boast or rejoice. It's an editorial decision as to what the okay. editors of the translation are going to use there mm -hmm. okay. and what they want to emphasize. And, and I, I think before we leave this text, in the very center is one of my favorite verses in verse 8. God shows his love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And to me, that's a great affirmation of the truth that God rescues the undeserving. Mm -hmm. he, he rescued the undeserving in the Old Testament reading. Mm -hmm. He rescues sinners uh, by sending the Savior. And I think we'll even be able to see that in the gospel lesson, that uh, mm -hmm. th this is a God of grace. And it, Paul is really uh, driving our attention to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we, uh, if we look here at uh, Luke 11... Uh, verses 14 through 28. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places, seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition is that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Uh, we get the story about Jesus and the criticism that he faces as he's casting out demons. And the criticism he receives is that it's only by... Uh, Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons, that you are able to cast out these demons. Um, and Jesus makes the simple point that, well, if I am, th th it makes no sense. Why would I do something like that? It, uh, Satan's house would be divided against itself, and no house divided against itself can stand. So, you know, th it makes no sense, this criticism. But he gets to the deeper point. He gets to the deeper point here, which is that um, the criticism that he's receiving uh, is in response uh, not so much to Beelzebul or whoever it might be, but rather to the fact that the kingdom of God has come near. And that the kingdom of God has come near. And what are, how do they respond when the kingdom of God comes near? They reject it. They, they come up with any kind of an excuse that they might um, uh, to, to throw aside what they're, they're witnessing Christ do. Um, and then we have this interesting uh, teaching about... Um, what happens to the spirit when it leaves, that it, it, it wanders around and then it decides, I'm going to try where I came from and, and see if how things are going there and maybe I can find a spot there to live again. And, uh, and the last state of that person is even worse than the first. Um, and so it's kind of this interesting teaching about um, kind of Christ's work the more cosmic dimension of what Christ is doing in his ministry. It's not simply about, you know, being a good person and teaching people to be good people or something like that, but rather it's about uh, the kingdom of God coming near and what happens to uh, individuals when that kingdom of God does come near. Things really change for people. Um, the demons are truly cast out, um, and real transformation and healing uh, occurs in those who... Uh, whom, uh, who Christ touches. I wonder if there isn't also a personal reminder here that 
when you get rid of a bad habit mm -hmm. uh, call, or a demon, whatever it is, that's not enough. Otherwise, you're leaving a vacancy that some other evil mm -hmm. spirit can take over. You've got to fill that with mm -hmm. some, a void with something. And I think that's an important teaching that Jesus underscores here is that it's not enough just to clean house. Yeah. You've got to fill the house now with him and with God's presence because that's what's going to keep the demons from, from re-entering. And, mm -hmm. and when we had the movie The Exorcist some years ago, many years ago, parents came to me uh, and they said, well, how am I going to keep the devil from taking over my child when they're sleeping? And I said, well, first of all, your child's a baptized child of God, so God has put his name on your child. Secondly, if your child has Jesus in their heart, Jesus is there to keep the devil out. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is, reminds us of the importance of keeping Jesus at the very center sure. of our lives because he's at the center of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's uh, you know, a, a good thing to underscore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I do have a question about is in verse 19, when Jesus asked them, if I cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Mm -hmm. Now, is he incidentally letting us know that there were Jewish people who could throw out devils and do exorcisms, mm -hmm. and that they apparently worked? Uh, and if so, we don't hear about that a whole mm -hmm. lot in mm -hmm. rabbinic writings or anything else, but, well, but that illusion seems to be to a reality. Yeah. I highlighted that. I wanted to ask that question. Yeah. So there were exorcists. Uh, I'm guessing, based on this, based we, don't on have this. A lot, we don't have a whole lot of other uh, mm -hmm. documentation of that, of exorcisms that were being done. Um, but I know that uh, in the book of Acts, when the disciples cast out a demon, um, who is the guy that comes to them and wants to pay money? Simon, yeah, Simon, Simon Magus, Simon Magus mm -hmm. wants to so that he can do it too. Mm -hmm. And so there must have been people who had the reputation anyway mm -hmm. of doing it, whether they were authentically doing it or not. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a body of it's called Hermetic literature. It's from rose from Egypt, and in that we actually do find uh, Jesus's name mentioned in certain spells and incantations, mm. and uh, um, certainly not not Christian, but Sort of this idea that we'll we'll we'll, we'll throw the book at them, you know. Yeah. We'll we'll okay. throw the book at them. If, if this is a powerful name, we'll see if it works. We'll mm -hmm. see if it sticks. But um, well, didn't the disciples come back and say Jesus? They were casting out yeah. demons in your name, and mm -hmm. we told them to stop. And he said, yeah. "Don't." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there apparently were other people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And apparently there were a few demons, and there needed to be a few exorcisms. Right. They yeah. all came out when Jesus was here. Yeah. Yeah. You get to wrap it up. I get to okay. wrap this up. Thank you for joining uh, us this week on Talking Sunday Readings. I uh, hope that you'll uh, leave a like and, and share us and come back next week for another episode of Talking Sunday Readings.